All sentient beings who, although self and all appearances are dharma datu by nature, have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay, so we're gonna look at just very briefly um, a little history of this text that we're using this retreat. So just very briefly, um, the author is Changya Rolpe Dorje, and he was alive from 1717 to 1786. And he was the reincarnation of the great Sakya tradition scholar and statesman, Pakpa Lodra Gelsen. So he had that really interesting mixture of being able to be, you know, like a politician, someone who was involved with um, all sorts of administrative duties, as well as being an amazing scholar of Buddhism and a scholar of things in general. So he was kind of a, an amazing figure in his time. And he had a very strong advisory relationship with the Chinese emperor and a deep connection with the Dalai Lama and Panchen Lama of that time period. He actually was instrumental in finding the eighth Dalai Lama. So he was very close with the seventh Dalai Lama. And then when he passed away, he was uh, part of the team that found the next one. So he also had a very deep practice to be able to have a clear enough mind to be able to do this. Um, he was a very important sutra translator um, of Chinese, Manchurian, Mongolian, and Tibetan, and many of his works are still used today. So interesting about him is that he was a translator scholar and also was kind of right in amongst it with uh, the politics of the time. He himself had to flee and leave his monastery because of various wars at the time. So he had to put his teachings into practice, otherwise he wouldn't have survived with good mental health. So he was you know, a brainy kind of a figure, a well-studied figure, but then he had all these traumatic events and uh, tons of traveling and lots of interaction with the secular world that meant that he also had a good foothold and grounding and awareness in the issues of the time. So um, his text is just, it's incredibly unique in the way it frames things. And I think it's really beautiful and very tangible as well. So um, I first received this teaching from one of my teachers, Geshe Lobzang Jamyang at Chenrezig Institute in 2006. And it's possible that Chenrezig Institute still has transcripts of those teachings if you ever wanna write and ask. But Geshe taught this once a week for, I don't know, I wanna say three or four months just as part of his ongoing teachings. And it was something that he used in his practice a lot. And I think brought him a lot of connection and joy. So that's my first relationship with this text was in 2006 with Geshe Jamyang. And then I was reminded of this text by Yangzi Rinpoche um, late 2020. So, um, Yangzi Rinpoche, as you know, teaches at Matripa College. He's the founder and the president of Matripa College. 
And I decided to just audit uh, for a semester because I was stranded in Montana and I thought it would be a good thing to do, especially because he was teaching on Zoom. And so Rinpoche just taught this um, in the previous semester and he went really into a lot of depth with it. And I was reminded how much I love this text and I kept thinking of you guys when he was teaching it. So I don't know if it was random projection, if it was inspiration, what it was exactly, but when I was reminded of this text, when Myungzi Rinpoche taught it, I thought of all of you at Human Spirit and I felt like you might have a connection with it. So I hope that's true. It could just be all a fantasy in my head, but uh, that's the connection there. Um, so you remember he was hosted just a few, what, a week ago or so at Human Spirit, but we're also going to do a meditation with him on uh, Wednesday. It's pre-recorded, so, you know, I wish it could be live, but he sends his hellos and his blessings, and he said it was okay that I used this session for you guys. So he'll lead a Mahamudra meditation on Wednesday for all of you. So then uh, His Holiness also taught this text um, just in February and a recording of that teaching um, you guys will see tomorrow and it has subtitles, you have the transcript. So hopefully um, seeing it from His Holiness will help the connection be even deeper and you'll be able to connect with the lineage of blessings in that way. So um, it was also requested by FPMT, it was requested by Lama Zopa Rinpoche, which brings kind of a, a stronger karmic connection because all of us are now affiliated with this organization, whether we <laughs> realize it or not. So it was requested on our behalf and His Holiness gave this teaching for this organization that we're a part of. So the hope is the karmic connection is stronger. So the understanding will be clearer. That's the hope. Okay, so we'll, we'll get into the text now. The first verse. You who reveals bare the wonder of profound dependent arising nature. Oh my guru, your kindness is boundless indeed. Kindly reside in my heart as I utter these spontaneous words from the thoughts flickering through my mind. And now Ranan will read it in Hebrew. So just kind of sit with that for a moment. And this is, of course, Rolpe Dorje's words about, you know, how he came to develop this text, how he came to develop this understanding was very much through a heart connection with his teacher. And when we think about the teacher, we're really thinking about that quality that moves the mind towards transformation. So it, the literal guru, the human figure that you've met, of course, is very significant, but they're really the voice or the gateway for something far more profound and something far more ephemeral and formless than the literal person who you've met. So we ask the guru to reside at our heart, in a sense, merge with the inner guru or wake up the inner guru. So to be asking for blessings, to want inspiration is really a conversation we're having with ourself to say, please open. And then we get into the analogies. So there's a few analogies in this text that get repeated a few times. So if we can kind of get the main ones, then the text is gonna make more sense as the retreat continues. So the first analogy of course is the mother. And the mother is analogous for the emptiness of inherent existence, the quality that all phenomena have, 
and is their ultimate truth. So this is the concept to be very tidy and clear about intellectually. And then once you're clear about it intellectually, we work on it experientially and to actually have a direct realization at some point, you know, this life or the next or whenever. But it's important to realize that when we say the mother in this context, we're talking about the space of infinite possibility. We're talking about a quality that everything that exists have. Everything that exists is lacking inherence. Yeah, so this is a non-affirming negation. It doesn't imply what the potentiality is turning into. It's not kind of directing us towards, so therefore it's this concrete thing. It's groundless, but it's not nothing. And, you know, no matter how many times we say it, keep hearing it more and more deeply that emptiness doesn't mean nihilism. Emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness is a characteristic, which is incredibly good news because it means that things can change, because it means that transformation is possible. If things weren't empty, we would have to be stuck as we are indefinitely. Suffering couldn't end, happiness couldn't increase, but because things are empty, we're able to evolve. So verse two, this lunatic child who lost his old mother long ago is about to realize by chance what he has not recognized. She has been with him all along. Nana? So it's quite striking and quite direct language, lunatic child, right? The lunatic child, it can sound pejorative. It could sound like it's looking down on, but it's actually just a description of us, right? So this lunatic child is an analogy for ourselves who are under the influence of ignorance and disturbing emotions, behaving immaturely and without understanding reality. So, you know, just to think about changing our identity our identity as an adult, our identity as a scholar or an expert or someone with this degree or that degree, someone who is a parent or a spouse, changing the identity for a moment to really see we are a lunatic child. We are immature and we don't understand reality because we have innate ignorance because we haven't recognized our mother. We're lost. Just like a little child, if, she, if, if a little child was lost in a supermarket looking for their mother, you can imagine this scene, right? The child is looking through all the aisles, going up and down, looking at people, seeing, are you my mother? And the child becomes more and more frantic. The child becomes more and more kind of crazed and confused and suffering, not realizing the mother was with them all the time. So this is us. And I think that just like when we were doing early Lom Rim and talking about how important it is to see ourselves as like a sick person and the Dharma as medicine, if we don't acknowledge where we are, then there's no spaciousness, there's no openness 
to hear what will make us mature, what will make us sane. If we don't realize that we're a little bit crazy, if we don't realize that we're a little immature, we'll never have receptor sites for the wisdom we need to get out of that. So also, you know, there's something very fragile and delicate and sweet about a child as well. There's something curious and open that has possibilities. And we can put our identity there as well, where it's not like we're this set in our ways, middle-aged person that we are already. Think of ourselves as a child full of possibilities that despite being immature, despite without understanding reality, still we have this incredible potential. We can change, we can shift, we can learn. So hold that part of your identity as well. So then verse three, she, meaning the mother, is perhaps that is and is not quietly spoken by my brother dependent arising. This diverse subject object world is my mother's gentle smile. This cycle of birth and death, her deceptive words. Anna. כך סיפר לי בחבר אחי הבכור, התהוות פיתות. במובן של מופעי הסובייקט אובייקט, הוא חיוכה השלב של אימי. התמורות של חגים ומוות, אל מילותיה המתעתעות. Okay. So the last two sentences are intriguing. We'll come back to the brother in a moment, but this diverse subject object world is my mother's gentle smile. So if the mother is emptiness, the mother is potential, the mother is the birthplace, then this world that we're looking at, the appearance of subject and object, is just an expression of that same quality. The cycle of birth and death, samsara, her deceptive words. So of course the deception is not really coming from her. The deception is coming from our relationship with her. Because we haven't recognized her, then we have this cycle of birth and death. So the deception is coming from us, but it seems like it's her who's deceiving us. The diversity of the subject object world, kind of the play and the art and the music and the drama and all of the beauty and all of the tragedy, see it as just like an expression on her face, any number of expressions, but it's coming from the same place. It's an interesting way of framing this teaching that we've heard so many times, to put it in these more poetic terms, to kind of sit with it as more relational. It can bring an interesting experience. So then brother, my brother is analogous to dependent arising. So the way things exist in dependence on <coughs> causes and conditions, parts and whole, as well as context, and being merely designated on a valid basis. So brother, right? So the brother is from the mother, but we're also related to him. That's interesting to sit with, right? The brother. So the, you know, what is born from emptiness is dependent arising. What is born from emptiness is dependent arising. It's a different way of explaining it than how we normally explain it, but it's still pointing to the same teaching that we're used to, which is that the reason why things are empty 
is because they depend on causes, substantial causes, the main thing, as well as conditions, that which waters and nurtures and brings them to life. And that is true of all impermanent phenomena. Then all things are empty because they dependently arise also refers to dependency on parts and whole, which refers to both impermanent and permanent phenomena. So for something to be considered a whole, it must have parts. For something to be considered parts, it's in reference to a whole. There is no such thing as parts without a whole or a whole without parts. Right, which is why sometimes when people are saying shortcut languages like we are all one and everything is oneness, you'll see some of the Buddhist teachers have resistance to that phrasing because oneness seems to imply that there are no parts, all right? And even if we're infinitely connected, so much so that the lines are very abstract still, relatively speaking, there are distinctions between you and me. It's just our added sense of believing these appearances of duality that makes it problematic, right? So parts depend on whole, whole depend on parts. Everything depends upon having parts to be considered a whole, etc. right? More in tune with your work perhaps as things being dependent upon context. So this being a large room in comparison to the room next to it, which is smaller, but in reference to a different house, it might be the large one, that everything exists in dependence upon context, I think is very important when we start discussing what is significant and what is not significant for an individual. Right? This comes up in your work a lot, I think, where something that was a key moment in time that they have built their identity narrative upon might not be at all significant for someone with a different kind of life, but a similar event. And then for us as an individual, what we look at our timeline of our life and we say, that was important, that was significant. This is why I am who I am. This is how I got this way. Those features that we choose to shine a spotlight on, we're shining the spotlight on. They don't exist as lit up from their own side. They're not significant divorced from context. And yet they appear to be. And that's part of the deception is that what is significant to us seems like self-existent, necessarily significant. We forget how much we're attributing significance to things that just happened. Yeah. And there's all sorts of practical, good psychological reasons for saying this was significant. But if we can soften the edges a little bit by remembering emptiness, then we don't fixate on building our identity around those places we've chosen to shine a spotlight. So then we have being merely designated on a valid basis, which is of course the most subtle understanding of dependent arising. And there's many conversations about what makes a valid basis, how it is we merely designate, but briefly how we choose to label things is based on our karmic disposition, on our pattern of habits, on what came before, on conditioning. What we label on has to be valid in terms of the world, in terms of worldly convention. So it's a delicate thing because to say from a distance, this is this and that is that is not problematic. But the closer you get, the harder it is to find some core essence or thingness in amongst the thing that is telling you its identity. The closer you get, the more it dissolves into parts. So my brother, what is born from the mother, my brother, what I am related to 
who I am a sibling with, I too am dependently arisen. So then I'm gonna to jump to verse seven. Not finding my father when sought is in fact finding my mother. My father is found in my mother's lap. That's how kind parents save their child, I'm told. Anna. אם מציאתו של אבי בחיפוש אחריו, הוא למעשה מציאתה של אמי. אבי נמצא בחלקה של אמי. לכן נאמר שהחיבורים טובי הלב מציגים את ילדם. So this is the final piece in the analogy. There's um, a verse later on that has um, some animal analogies, which we may or may not have time for, but basically the main analogy is mother, brother, child, father. And you know these relationships are our everyday relationships. And this is the contents of the practice. So my father in this context is an analogy for the object which we investigate, the basis on which emptiness is established. So if we're looking for emptiness, we're looking for the mother, we're looking everywhere. And she, and you know, we're, we're looking and we're looking and, we, and then we're looking for our father and we're looking for safety and paternal and support. And we just find him there in the mother's lap, meaning anything we look to any object we look at has the emptiness we seek. We're not looking for emptiness separate from the things we're attributing it to. There is no emptiness without a referent. There is no emptiness out of nowhere. Emptiness is always describing a quality that something has. So the object, the father, the thing exists, but he exists there in the mother's lap. Yeah, and so just kind of sit with that. It's an interesting framing. Yeah, the object we investigate, whatever it is, object, person, situation, etc., that's the basis that emptiness is established on. They're always together. So my father in my mother's lap also means that all the diverse things, pure and impure objects are manifestations of the emptiness. And therefore all actions, agents and so forth are the manifestations of this emptiness, which stays here in my mother's lap. So there is no phenomena that is not empty. All phenomena stay together with their emptiness. They cannot be separated. It stays here in my mother's lap. Yeah. So that's probably enough verses for today. Yeah. Um, I think that the teaching by His Holiness that you'll see tomorrow is going to clarify more pieces. Don't worry about being too scholastic with it. It's something that is just to reinforce the things that you've already studied. Um, I think it's really important, really, really, really important that you don't separate your study from your practice. Sometimes when we talk about our practice, we make it sound like it's only that which is done on the meditation cushion, that our practice is only meditation. When in fact, the study is the very thing that allows us to meditate in an accurate way. And our approach to our study and the contents of our study 
is our practice. That is our practice. What we study bleeds through into our daily life. What we study bleeds through then into the other subjects that we study. So the important thing here is to not become overly intellectual, of course, but on the other hand, don't become so obsessed with experience that you miss the fact that study has its own experience. That the analysis that the Galukpa tradition of Tibetan Buddhism invites us to do transforms us, the hearing transforms us, the reflection transforms us, and then the meditation transforms us. So it's not like we have to wait for transformation until we get to the meditation cushion. And this is very key for our approach to study as the years go by and maybe it's less structured or it's less frequent. Hopefully not, hopefully we all keep studying forever. But to remember that your approach towards the material and your approach towards study is as important as the content as well. And if they're not mutually reinforcing each other, something needs to be examined. So what happens to us when we're inspired? What happens to us when we're confused? What happens to us when we're frustrated, when we're competitive? when we're neurotic, these are the learnings that we're bringing to the content itself. And it's really important that we're sort of staying a little observational with ourselves as we approach content and ask, what is my attitude towards all this? Because that is key. So gradually we integrate, but to keep coming back to what is my approach to this? What is my relationship with this? Whatever this is, whether it's hearing, contemplating, or meditating, what is my attitude towards it? Because that's the key thing in developing new neural pathways, new habit patterns, transform karma, and development. So, um, so don't leave that behind. And the in-between session times is really important for just kind of one, of course, relax the mind, of course, have a break, look at the sky, enjoy the beautiful views around Neva Shalom, but also keep watching yourself, you know, not in a tight way, but just noticing. Yeah, keep noticing and notice when your opinions start to feel concrete. Like, hmm, it's hot and it might be hot. And then it's hot, therefore, I'm uncomfortable. Okay, still true. Uncomfortable, therefore, grumpy. Too far, <laughs> right? You know, you're just kind of like watching how your same old thought patterns play out over the course of the day under the influence of this ignorance that keeps believing appearances. Yeah, so we're trying to just consciously notice our own habit of believing appearances. And whenever we can, just very gently challenging them and say, is that, is that it? Is that the whole story? Is that all that's true? Just nudging it on the sides and adjusting when you can. Yeah. So a big piece of this retreat will be looking at the four keys or the fourfold analysis. So if you wanted to review that, um, the reading from Teachings from Tibet by Geshe Ngawan Darge um, that you all have is useful. If you'd rather not, if you'd rather just keep a really spacious mind and come back to whatever your mind has space to come back to, that's totally fine too. The key thing here is just to kind of notice if your mind is getting bored, that means there's space to upgrade. If your mind is feeling overwhelmed, then kind of let go of content. Yeah, and it'll be different day by day. As you know, you've done many retreats before now. But just to kind of like take that approach of, if I'm walking around and my mind is kind of hungry for stimuli and kind of easily bored, then you can challenge yourself to upgrade your understanding or deepen your mindfulness or both. 
if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling like it's all too much, then let go of content, let go of intellectual stuff and just be with the simple things that you know to be true and reinforce and deepen them. So with the four keys, with the fourfold analysis, just remember it's mainly looking at the object of negation. Yeah, we're mainly looking at the illusory self, the self that doesn't exist at all. And that work is the work of our lifetime because it's the very thing that pushes up against the rest of the world and phenomena and people and causes us to feel under threat. It's the very thing that kind of blocks our expansive equanimity. And it's the thing that prevents us from realizing emptiness, of course. So if we don't know what we're negating, we can't negate it. You know, like that old example that gets used a lot. If you don't know what an elephant is, you can't say there is no elephant in the room. So if you don't know what an inherently existent self is, you can't negate it because you haven't found it. So, you know, that's a nice kind of side project or primary project if you feel mental energy for it is to just keep the hunt for the object of negation in quiet moments alone or in quiet interactions with others when the eye flares. Yeah, when that sense of very solid identity flares, when there's a sense of being supported and lifted or a sense of being challenged or pushed aside, you know, those times ask, where is that self that feels so real? Yeah. So the object of negation is gonna be a little bit of a project of this uh, retreat and it comes up in some of the later verses um, and I'll keep talking about those as time goes by. But I thought maybe it'd be good to just shift and do meditation now and um, not add any more into your heads because you've had to settle into a new space and get yourself organized and stuff like that. So let's um, shift into meditation. Yeah, and really ground yourself back in the seat. If you have any kind of hanging thoughts from that presentation, you can quickly jot them down so you don't lose them, but just kind of get yourself resettled. So we'll move into uh, a more traditional meditation in a moment, but for now, we'll just start with a very gentle reflection. You can have your eyes open or your eyes closed, completely up to you, but we'll just kind of go back over those verses and just see what impression they make on your mind. Yeah, so just take a minute. in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. I'm investigating this idea of recognizing my mother, of seeing the emptiness of inherent existence, of myself and all things. You who reveals bare the wonder of profound, dependent, arising nature. O oh, my guru, your kindness is boundless indeed. Kindly reside in my heart.
as I utter these spontaneous words from the thoughts flickering through my mind. And so we just think about this wonder that's been revealed by understanding profound dependent arising through the kindness of our teacher. Whether that's the teacher-ness or the guru-ness embodied in so many people, books, forms, or whether it's a specific figure like his holiness, or just the quality of teaching being able to be conveyed. The specific thing that's been conveyed is the profound dependent arising. Infinite interconnectedness. The way nothing is alone or stands alone or is created alone. Despite it appearing otherwise. So imagine that whatever understanding you have of dependent arising takes root in your heart. This lunatic child who lost his old mother long ago is about to realize by chance what he has not recognized. She has been with him all along. I am a so it only seems as though we have lost our mother. She has been with us all along. That which gives birth, the place from which potentiality resides. The possibilities of our life seems sometimes as though we've lost them long ago. Maybe even lost connection with our childlike nature. 
almost become crazy searching for possibility to open up again, for things to transform and develop. That the mother has been with us all along. Mother and child are as if one. And so we connect with some compassion towards ourself who are under the influence of ignorance and disturbing emotions, who behave immaturely and without understanding reality, not just in the surface sense, but in the deep spiritual sense. Although in a relative sense, we are mature, professional adults with sanity and strength. Still underneath, there is stress and insecurity and suffering and mistakes because we haven't come to understand the way in which we are still a lunatic child. And so we generate compassion and kindness for this child that we are. Just confused. And like a child, we are able to develop, transform, learn, and go into spiritual adulthood with equanimity, kindness, and compassion. She is perhaps that is and is not quietly spoken by my brother, dependent arising. This diverse subject object world is my mother's gentle smile. This cycle of birth and death, her deceptive words. Millions of is, millions of is not, millions of subjective experiences, millions of objective reflections. This play of dependent arising
born from the mother. The differences, the diversity, the cycle of birth and death, all types of pleasure and pain, my mother's gentle smile, her various expressions. my brother, dependent arising, my sibling from the same source, the brother exists because of the mother. But one is only a mother when she gives birth. Emptiness and dependent arising, dependent arising and emptiness. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form, form is not other than emptiness. Empty because dependent. dependent on causes and conditions, like seeds with water and sunshine. dependent on parts and whole, like my body and the parts of my body. Because context history, conditioning, habits and patterns, the play of energy, karma. Etc. Not finding my father when sought is in fact finding my mother. 
My father is found in my mother's lap. That's how these kind parents save their child, I'm told. The father, the object we investigate, any object we investigate, anything seemingly definable as supportive or not supportive, present or absent. The closer we look for that object, the more we find its absence of inherence. The more we look for the father, the closer we come to finding the mother. Right there in her lap. Finding these parents saves us because through realizing emptiness directly, we cut the root of samsara, suffering, etc. All these diverse things, pure and impure objects, manifestation of the emptiness, and therefore all actions, agents, and so forth are the manifestations of this emptiness, which stays here in my mother's lap. Always together, always with us. The emptiness of agent, action, object creates the fullness of experience. The lifeblood of transformation. And so now just shift back to that clarity of mind, that open spacious awareness.
different thoughts and ideas and connections quietly digesting in the background. But right now, you're focusing on the clarity, the reflectiveness and spaciousness that's always with you. The main mind with bare awareness. And whether your thoughts are quiet or loud, whether they are verbal or nonverbal, they're not your interest right now. There is also always clarity simultaneously with the movement of mind. There is stillness, both. So emphasize what is still and clear. The mountain lake of your mind, pristine and reflective.
Try to be more with what reflects rather than what is reflected. Your attention remains spacious without spacey, relaxed without becoming vague, focused without tension. Quality of focus more important than what exactly you're focused on. and move from the spacious clarity of bare awareness to the simple and direct experience of your breath. Shift back to the breath without elaboration or judgment, just observation without control. Let the breath breathe let your attention be with it. Give it your interest.
one part of your mind watching your focus, using your introspection to make sure your focus is as stable as it can be, not too tight, not too loose. Just the breath.
and let go of your focus on the breath and shift to visualizing Shakyamuni Buddha in the space in front. Golden light representing and embodying your spiritual refuge. At his heart is Prajnaparamita, the mother of wisdom. At her heart is the Heart Sutra Mantra, surrounded by the syllable Ah. You can visualize in whatever language you like that represents these sounds. Tayata gate gate, paragate, parasamgate bodhisoha. So whether you just have a general impression of light or can specifically visualize Shakyamuni Buddha with Prajna Paramita, with the mantra, take a moment and stabilize. General impression of wisdom embodied in the form of light in front. Imagine that light goes out in all directions from the Heart Sutra Mantra at the heart of Prajna Paramita, who is at the heart of Shakyamuni Buddha. Light going out in all directions, embodying wisdom. Wisdom that is conjoined with method, with bodhicitta. ultimate bodhicitta. And as this wisdom light touches each sentient being, imagine that it ripens the seeds for wisdom within their own mental continuums. beginning to cut the root of suffering. Beginning to dispel the darkness of ignorance. This light, of course, reaches and fills you, those around you. But imagine it also goes to the various parts of the world in particular need of wisdom. Those areas that would be so benefited by understanding that we are all interdependent that we are all empty of inherent existence because we dependently arise. And the way in which we dependently arise is infinitely connected. Therefore, harm to each other makes no sense. It would be like one hand cutting another.
and the light continues to go out, blanketing the world in wisdom light, ripening the seeds for wisdom in all sentient beings. Wisdom to those whose minds are filled with hatred and fear. Wisdoms to those whose minds are filled with miserliness, addiction, helpless craving. Sending wisdom to those whose minds are filled with desire and distraction. Sending wisdom to those whose minds are filled with jealousy and competitiveness, to those with pride who are drunk with pleasure. To those living in fear and ignorance. Wisdom light everywhere. And then adding strength to that visualization of light, we add the mantra. Tai gata gate gate aragate arasam gate bodhi soha. Tayata Gate Gate Aragate Arasam Gate Bodhisoha Tayata Gate Gate Aragate Arasam Gate Bodhisoha Tayata Gate Gate Aragate Arasam Gate Bodhisoha Tayata Gate Gate Aragate Arasam Gate Bodhi Soha Tayata Gate Gate Aragate Arasam Gate Bodhi Soha Tayata Gate Gate Aragate Arasam Gate Bodhi Soha Namaste. 
And the mantra continues to reverberate out. And we dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. and you can relax your attention. Okay, so I'll see you first thing in the morning and um, then you'll have pre-recorded meditations for the first part before lunch and then a little bit later I'll join you live so Laila Tov and uh, see you at seven which is right before bed <laughs> good night <laughs>